created the heavens and the earth. And yet, the Bible says, was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God, the Bible says, moves over the entire. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And the Bible says, and God saw the light that he has made. And he affirms that it was good. And God divided the light from darkness. And the light he called day. And the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning was the first day. Amen. Amen. If you take the first verse of scriptures from it, the rest, to some extent, becomes meaningless. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It tells of a supreme being, one who made everything. It gives his sovereignty over all things. It expresses his power, his knowledge, his ability to do everything that we can imagine. On this note, I welcome you all to this Sabbath Divine Service. And what you say? Amen. Um, last week, some of us were around far away in Nigeria. Good luck. We were in your country, uh, close to your state. Um, we had a nice time there. We were invited by Dr. Pupin um, to the Nigeria Alive Mission Empowerment um, Conference. Um, it was a nice experience that some of us will forever cherish. There is something that is happening around the globe, in case you are not aware. Young men, young men like you and I are setting new agenda for God's work. Uh, probably it is about time that we rise up and take action for the very mission that we have been called to. All over the world, in Africa, everywhere, young people are jeering up for God's work. They are doing everything possible to hasten His coming. They are doing everything possible under their control <coughs> to spread the three angels' message. I don't know what you are doing, but it looks like some of us are sleeping on the job. May the good Lord strengthen us Amen. as we cheer up for missions. Come next weekend, um, we will have a visit of uh, an evangelist by name Zuki Yada name. You have to do the South African Zulu language. I don't know how to do it. Um, but we call him um, Zuki. Zuki is a member of the General Conference Executive Committee. Um, we happened to meet him um, during the NASCI NUSD Alumni Homecoming. Uh, Friday evening, 6 o'clock, he will be here worshiping with us for his presence on Sabbath morning and afternoon. He wants to share the word of God um, with us. Don't come alone, invite friends as we listen to God's word. Amen. Amen. But for the few minutes, we ask that you speak your words to us. Let not the voice of our dear body be heard. My Father, let your voice be heard. Hide me behind the cross, O oh Lord, and speak your words to us. May we treasure today. And may today set a new agenda for all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you are long, you are allowed to preach or speak on the simple subject. Better to die than to live. And in case you want to share anything on Facebook or all the other social media, um, um, whatever we have, um, it goes hashtag Better to die than to live. Yesterday I shared the title of this where people were asking me what is happening to you. I've lost someone. Better 
to die than to live. Our scripture was from Jonah chapter 4, verse 1 to 3 and 8. Turn with me to that scripture. Jonah 4, 1 to 3. If you are there, say amen. amen. If you are not there, say have mercy. Oh, come on. All right. Uh, Jonah chapter 4, verse 1, 3 and 8. I'm the wrong seven, but uh, God will see us today. Children chapter 4, verse 1, 3, 2, 3, 8. Let's say the word of God. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying? Was I not saying to you? When I was yet in my country, therefore I fled before unto Tarsus. For I knew that thou art a gracious God, a merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repented thee of the evil. Therefore, now, O oh Lord, take and beseech thee. I'm telling you, take my life from me. Why? For it is better for me to die than to the visit. And it came to pass that when the sun did arise, that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah, that he fainted and wished in himself to die. And said, It is better for me to die than to live. The question is, why would a prophet of God make such statements? Has he been struck down by leprosy? Has, has uh, and his wife divorced him? Why on earth would a prophet of God make such pronounced statements that it is better for him to die than to live? Has he been stabbed at the back? Was he the last man standing? Was he the prophet uh, uh, that was going through turbulence and persecution in his days? Why did Jonah make that book say that it is better to die than to live? We know the story of Jonah too well. The book of Jonah is quite fascinating. It's a book of the scriptures. It is said to be the best known yet least understood. If you ask an atheist about, about Jonah, an atheist can narrate the story of Jonah beautifully as he is a theologian. It is widely read. The book is the most bio biographical of the minor prophets and the least prophetic. The story of the prophet itself is a message. Children love to read the dramatic narrative, but believe its seemingly simple story are profound spiritual truths that are good for us. The book exalts the sovereignty of God. God is mentioned in that four chapter book 35 times. Most people focus on the great fish. But the real focus of the book of, of Jonah is the sovereignty of God. God is mentioned, as I've said, 35 times in the four chapters. We see God and we see his sovereignty over the elements of nature, over animals, over everything that he has created. He demonstrates his ownership of creation in this book. And in this book, we recognize that salvation is of the Lord. We see God extend the mercy and grace to hated sailors, to a rebellious prophet, and no other country or city than Nineveh. Let's see if we can track uh, Jonah and see when the book was written. The timing is somewhere in the middle of the 8th century, around the time Elijah and Elisha were in existence. Jonah may well have been a student in those days of the school of the prophets. Probably he might have graduated from that school. The timing of the book is drawn from reference from um, Jonah in Kings chapter 14 during the reign of Jeroboam II, the king of Israel. He restored 
the coast of Israel from the Hamath until the sea, the scripture says, of the plain, according to the word of the Lord of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah. Second case of the 14, verse 25. So he makes reference to Jonah, who was from Gath Hapha. Jonah was a prophet from the northern kingdom who exercised a ministry in the north. This would have been around 150 years before Solomon. Also, the judgment of God was heavy and bitter on the nation for their sin through their Assyrians. God extended grace to these undeserving people. 2 Kings 14, 26, 27 says, For the Lord saw the affliction of Israel, that it was very bitter. Later on I will explain, For there was not any shut up, nor any left, nor any helper for Israel. For years and years, the Assyrians have, have, have went war on Israel. They have been Israel's cruel and bitter enemy. So for God, to bring down the affliction of Israel, he needed to work on the Assyrians. Second Kings 14, 26, 27, have that for us. God does not always deal with his rebellious people by chastisement. There are times that he seeks to draw them to repentance by extending grace to them. That is one reason why we cannot simply judge the spiritual state of a person, a church, and a nation. Because at any point in time, God might not chastise them, God might not destroy them, but he will draw him to himself. God used Jonah as the voice of grace. The prophet witnessed this mercy and grace being extended to the people who certainly did not deserve it. And despite Jonah's exposure to the undeserving grace of God in his own life and his own people, this was the very thing that Jonah struggled with. Why should God, a God of justice, a God who pays evil, a God who rebukes, chastises, not destroy that great city, Nineveh. This book, Jonah, opens unto us a window into the heart of God for Lord's sinners, like myself, like yourself. This is how someone puts it. Whenever and wherever God is pleased to manifest His grace and goodness, it is our part to acknowledge and rejoice in the manifestation. It may possibly be done through instruments that we should not have expected to be peculiarly honored, or in regions where, which are in, in, in manner cut off from our sympathies and regards. That such showers of blessing should be sent there while sincerely a drop falls where our desires and efforts are mainly engaged. Better to die than to live. Let's look at the reasoning of, of, of the prophet Jonah. Jonah, his resume, his CV, he was called as a prophet of the Lord. This allowed him to stand in the presence of God and communicate to God physically. The question is, how can someone who communicates with God physically speak from heaven and he hears God's voice directly say it is better for him to die than to live. His ministry probably has had an impact on lives of the people. Unlike many other prophets, his prophecies were fulfilled before his very eyes which no doubt increased his credibility. Somehow, uniquely, his prophetic message simply prophesies the blessings and grace upon Israel. He exercised his ministry in Israel when at the same time there were great men of God, Elijah 
and the Elishas. Number four, he would have had multiple opportunities to witness the ministry of those graduating from the schools of the prophets. But this prophet was bold to tell God face to face that God to take my life because it is better to die than to live. When Jonah is sent by God, he is all in all likelihood no apostle. He was a seasoned prophet. The Bible does not give us past privileges of or past issues about Jonah, about his obedience to God, but we know he was not an amateur. And even though he was a great prophet, yet he disobeyed God so many times and he was willing to lose his life than to go on an errand. He was ready to lose his life for God's will and grace to be extended to a sinner. Bear in mind, great men of God have fallen in maturity. David was in early 50s when he fell with Bathsheba. Noah was over 600 years. Moses was 120. When by anger he strike the rock. The book of Jonah, friends, show us that God can still use unfaithful servants for his glory. For Jonah is the world's best missionary, yet God used him to prove salvation is of the Lord. The story reveals the method that God often uses to bring his errant children back to himself back to obedience. It shows, friends, how God can achieve multiple purposes through the same incidents. Just imagine it. Saving Gentile sailors, saving the Ninevites, while at the same time chastising and restoring that great prophet, Jonah. Take your Bibles as we read from the scriptures. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 to 2. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come before me. Right from the beginning of the book, we see the sovereignty and omniscience of God exemplified. It is he who sends his servants. It is he who tells them what they should do, what they should preach about. No man can appoint himself to being a prophet of God. It is God whose sovereignty saves and calls people at his own appointed time. The voice of God came unto Jonah, the son of Amitai. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. The Lord also reminds Jonah by this statement that he sees every sin and takes note of it. Because he said, go to Nineveh because their wickedness has come up before me. This is not just true of Israel, but of all other nations. Jehovah is the God of the Nineveh, as well as the God of Israel. His sovereignty is not limited to bodies. Some people imagine that Jehovah of the Old Testament is harsh. He is disinterested in the Gentiles. But the book of Jonah reveals to us that no, he was interested in their affairs. As a prophet of God, Jonah should have been fully prepared to obey the command of God. Elijah, Elisha all day, they all sent messages to, 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 to foreign Gentile countries, but Jonah should have emulated them. He said, he didn't. He didn't do it the way God wanted him to do. The message that Jonah proclaimed was required to preach to the Ninevites was a powerful message. It was a message against sin. He was to call for repentance. And not only that, he was to cry against the city of Nineveh. 
This is not God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. It's not your best life is now. This was bad news from a sovereign God. In the mind of the Ninevites, this was no good news at all. For your sins have reached up to me. And behold, I give you 40 days. I will destroy you. Our subject, better to die than to live. Jonah's mission, friends, was very, very unprecedented. It was very shocking. Many years ago, some prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and the rest, and Amos, all spoke against the Gentile cities, against Gentile nations of their sins. But in this instance, only Jonah was asked to go to that great city to warn them. His mission was unprecedented. Nineveh was a great city. Nineveh was cruelest and violent. It was the capital of the Assyrian nation that was the world's superpower at that time. It was an impressive capital of a great empire. It was located in modern day Iraq near the city of Mosul on the river of Tigris. The Assyrians were a great threat to the Israelites and eventually the nation will fall to them 722 BC. Nineveh was feared and reviled. In today's language, Assyria was a terrorist state. The people of Nineveh were feared and reviled by their neighbors in equal measure. The Assyrians were the Nazis of the ancient world. In a day of heartless cruelty, their reputation excelled. Now prophesied and said it was a bloody city. In the book of Jonah, Jonah was supposed to call them into repentance. They were notorious for their atrocities. When conquering other nations, they buried their enemies alive, impaling people of sharp bows in the hot sun. Not only that, they skinned their captured slaves alive. The ancient records of Assyrians that survive today actually tells of their cruelty. You can't do, you can't go to Iraq, even in this present state now and stand on the streets of Iraq and proclaim judgment on them. Yet, it was the nation that was the object of course missionary outreach. They were notorious for their atrocities, yet God had mercy and compassion on them. They were cruel, yet God wanted to save them from their cruelty. They were rebels, Yet, God wanted to save them. The question is, why on earth could God be helping the enemies of his people? Why on earth should God send the prophet Jonah from Israel to, to their enemies' camp to, to, to preach mercy and grace to them and bring them back? Why on earth could do go to that? Helping Israel's enemies. But Jonah, the Bible says, rose up, verse 3, unto Tarshish from the presence of God. The prophet, instead of going to um, <laughs> Nineveh, which was very close to him, he instead ran far to Tarshish. He was running on the way. He is the prophet of God who has been called, anointed by him. Go preach the gospel. But he says, no, I'm not. No, no, I'm not. A prophet that has ordained, commissioned, and given a specific duty, assignment that no other prophet has been called to do. He said, no. Running away. You will expect that the next text that should follow this verse should be and Jonah, the faithful prophet of the Lord, headed immediately straight to preach the truth. This wasn't the case. The Bible says, but Jonah rose up to flee, not to the but to touch 
instead of going north to lead the way, Jonah went towards Tarsus. Tarsus probably is modern day Spain. He, the prophet, was refusing God. Jonah did, did the exact opposite of what God told him. God called him to go east, he went west. God directed him to travel over land. He went down through the sea, sent to a big city. No, he went to a small city. The question is, why did Jonah refuse? We can make some guesses. Let's make one. The first guess is that the mission that the, the mission that he was entrusted with made neither practical or theological sense. Why? Over the years, prophets have spoken against the against um, Nineveh. Prophesied, prophesied, prophesied. Now has prophesied that God will destroy that great city of Nineveh. But yes, so God asked him to go and speak to Nineveh. It was. It, it did not make any practical or theological sense. Number two, the chances of death was high and eminent. How long will the Jewish rabbi have lasted in 1941 in the streets of Berlin and called the Nazis to repentance? Number three, as a fulfillment of prophecy, is going to deliver make no justification. There was no justification. There was no theological sense in that. Yet, Jonah had good reasons to disobey God. He disobeyed God because he had a problem. Jonah's problem, friends, was not that he did not understand his commission. No. His, his problem was not like he did not have money to travel. His problem was not like he does not have resources to go on God's errands. No. He just did what he wants to do. It doesn't seem that it was fear. And it doesn't seem that he was not comfortable traveling. Everything points to the fact that he was very comfortable to go on an errand, but not Nineveh. God could send him anywhere in the world, but not Nineveh. His reason is that he does not like God's mercy. He does not cherish God's grace towards that great city, Nineveh. The Bible says, and it is pleased to a city. And he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord, saying, When I was yet in my country, therefore I fled before that, for I knew thou art precious. Jonah knew his theology too well. He knew that God definitely would save Nineveh. He knew that when he goes to proclaim the good news to Nineveh, Nineveh will be converted. Nineveh will repent. He did not want to see them in heaven. He did not want to see his brother, his neighbors, on the right foot. He did not want God to extend that grace to them. But later on, he learned his lesson too well. And he said, salvation is of the Lord. So this problem was not with himself. His problem was with God. Why would God extend mercy to these Assyrians who have troubled us, who have done everything possible under this sun, not for Israel to have peace? We have been slaves to them. Over the years, we've served them. They've killed us. They've raped our women. They have done everything possible under the sun, not for God's country, not for God's nation, to have peace. But yesterday, why would God extend mercy to them? Ironically, one of the reasons God was likely sending him to preach was to shame Israel. Listen to friends. One of the reasons God asked Jonah to go to Nineveh was to shame Israel. 
for years. Anytime they are under any tribulation, under any empire persecuting the nation of Israel, it is a time of sin. So God wanted to shame them and make a case against them. That see the Ninevites, those that you call hating, those that you call unbelievers, see them repenting of the atrocities and here you are still in your debt. The Bible says, verse 3 be, and he found a ship going to Tarshish, and he paid the fare thereof, and went down to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of God. Jonah fled away from his calling, and as he was fleeing away, he found a ship going to Tarshish. He just so happened that he, he found a ship right there living to a perfect location that he wanted to go. Money wasn't a problem to him. He seemingly had an advantage to run away from the presence of God. The devil, friends, always makes it easy for us to go the path of sin. There will always be a ship going to Tarsus with room for one. And it just happened so beautifully that there was a ship going to Tarsus. And that is what the devil did. The Sheba in the eye, in the eye line of David, as he walked over his rooftop in his house, she just happened to be there. David knew previously when he spared Saul's life in the cave that you cannot misinterpret the providence by disobeying God. You cannot. Numbers chapter 32 verse 23 says, Behold, ye have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sins will find you out. It may appear that Jonah had gotten away with his sins and, and, and his plan and everything was being executed perfectly. Uh, maybe as, as he finds his birth on the ship and going to touch it, he said, I'm done with you, God. It is finished. But as Moses warned in Numbers chapter 32, 23, be sure your sin will find you. There goes Jonah. Here comes God. This book of Jonah Friends, it's for us. Jonah, in this story, is us. Jonah proves that knowing God's will is not enough, nor is having the right theology in our creed enough. No, he, he proved that he can do everything that pleases his heart. He, 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 he told God, I don't need you. Leave me alone because it is better to die than to live. E.G. White has this to say, Review and Herod, April 18, 1907, it says, the happiest people in the world are those who trust Jesus and gladly do his bidding. Let me ask you, whose bidding are you doing? And many a times when the call comes to us, we quickly say we are unavailable and we reluctantly decide not to go on missions. I remember years back, their friends going to Liberia. It just so happened after the Liberia war. They were going to Liberia to do outreach. They called me, can you come? We need you to come. There is something that only you can do. And I said, no, no, I have work to do. I'm busy at the office. And they went and they came and they narrated the story and I repented. Friends, when God's call comes to us, there is no excuse. No excuse. No excuse. Jonah joined the ship of disobedience. The prodigal prophet will learn the truth in a hard way. But friends, God knows how to reach us. God's timetable come and fix that perfectly into the puzzle and he knows how to get us and how to reach us. And God catches up with all sinners at any point in time. It may not be now, but he will definitely catch you up. He deals with more swiftly than others, but he will eventually deal with every one of them. Verse 4 says, But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. When a believer, differently, 
disobeys a clear command of God, he should not presume that there will be no reaction. There is no escaping the power of God in a thousand worlds. He will pursue you with your disappointments. He will pursue you with your disasters. He will pursue you with your dissatisfaction. The Lord has chosen so many instruments to bring his disobedient children back to him. And in this instance, he chose the wind. Not a prophet like himself, but the wind. God knows exactly how to get our attention. In most chapter 2, chapter 9, verse 2, 2 to 4 says, Though they dig into hell, then shall my hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, then will I bring them down. And though they hide themselves in the top of Camel, I will search and take them out thence. And though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea, then will I command the serpent and he shall bite them. And though they go into captivity before their enemies, thence will I command the sword, and it shall slay them. I will set my eyes upon them for evil and not for good. God definitely will find us out if we do not repent. All is not well for Jonah. As, as it first appeared in the circumstance, how quickly things change. The Lord uses an unusual instrument, a wind, to bring the prophet's mind back to God. The Bible says, But the Lord sent a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest. God demonstrates his sovereign power over the natural elements here, and we read that God sent a great wind. He is Lord over the sea, and over the wind, and over Israel, and over your life. Do we not serve the Lord when it suits us? Do we not like to think that we are in control of our lives? The Lord has his ways and his ways and purposes. He can even simply use the wind to stop our tracks. God will put his finger on Jonah's sins through his incident. Many believers foolishly think that they can run away from their calling and commands of God by change in location. Perhaps they think that absenting themselves from the people of God will help. However, God can chastise you in the world. And in this instance, God chastised Jonah in the hating land. The Bible says, verse 5, then the mariners were afraid. When the wind was blowing, the mariners were afraid. And they cried, every man unto his God, and cast forth words that were in the ship into the sea. This storm is a severe storm of mercy of God. God is not trying to destroy Jonah, but simply get his attention. The purpose of God here is to redirect Jonah's mind to his mission and to his calling. But it took Hathens to rebook Jonah. Friends, Jonah did not reveal his ethnic identity to anyone, let alone his calling. He had no interest uh, in preaching to the Gentiles, even in the ship. God has his way making us do what Whatever we think we can do, his natural disasters, his natural desires, his natural things, because he's in control, he can redirect our paths to suit his purpose. Friends, bear in mind that when you sin, you do not sin alone. When we sin, we do not sin alone. All those on board were endangered by Jonah's sin. All too often when, when we sin, we hurt those around us. Instead of being a blessing to the Gentiles, this Hebrew was rather a curse to them. These sailors were probably Phoenician sailors who were especially skilled and renowned in, in their sailing business. And they recognized that this is not just a mere storm. Friends, a storm at sea reduces a man 
to his real size. Sometimes in our life, when we think everything is working out right for us, everything is cozy and, and we go, we tend to forget God. But not too long ago, three months down the line, this was a brother who was shouting and praying, I need a job, I need, and God grants you a job. And now he says, take your religion. I'm busy. Now when God strikes us, and the job is taken from our hands, soon are we we remember that, yes, there is a God that we need to serve. Yes, yes, there is a God that we need to turn to. The storm at sea, friends, will reduce a man to his real size. And it happened to Jonah. The sailor understood their lives were more precious than material things. Because they started throwing away everything that was in the ship, trying to make the ship lighter, so trying, to, try, trying to make their sail successful, doing everything possible to save themselves. These men recognize that some of the possessions that they have in their ship were not necessary. Friends, let me tell you one thing. If I haven't said it before, God grants us resources. Number one, for his work. Number two, for others. Number three, for ourselves. If you follow that Order. Jealousy will not be in you. Because before you think about yourself, you would have thought about God's work. Before you think about yourself, you would have thought of the brother who is in need. Material things is of no use to us. Luke chapter 12, verse 15 says, For a man's life consisted not in the abundance of things. When, when, when the ship was, was, was being shipwrecked, they started throwing their things away. But Jonah, the Bible says, was down in the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. This is tragic spectacle. The sailors try man's wisdom in throwing out the cargo and everything. To bring the crisis down. But there was a spiritual problem. And they said, every man should cry to his God. And the prophet of God, one who speaks directly to God, one who has the message to call the haters back to God, was down sleeping. Oh. Are we sleeping on the job? Are we sleeping on the job? Though their prayers were not divine inspired, the only man who knows the God, who knows how to, to pray well, was down sleeping. He is immune to the reality of his danger and of those around him with false peace of disobedience. And he was fast asleep. Friends, sin always inhibits our ability to discern spiritual realities as well as to pray and to witness for the Lord. We don't expect that God's servant to be the most sensitive in this area and because he has, he has seen the workings of God. He has seen God parting the Red Sea for the Israelites. He has seen how God dealt with the Egyptian army. He has seen everything. He knows the story too well. He has read it and read it over time. He knows and understands everything. He knows. But there he was sleeping. Something in Judges chapter 16 we read and the Bible says and he awoke out of his sleep and said, I'll go out as other times before. I'll go up, I'll go out as other times before and shake myself. And he wished not that the Spirit of God had departed from him. Backsliding, friends, makes you blind and foolish. Maybe you didn't get me. Let me repeat it. Backsliding makes you blind. And foolish. This was a prophet of God. This was a man who could intercede and call the name of God for the, for the, for the seed to calm down because he served the God who created everything. And here was he, down, sleeping. The man 
in touch with God, is fully aware of the dangers to the spiritual lives of those around him. But if you are not in touch with God, it will be very difficult for you to know and be aware of the dangers that surround your life. A Christian working in communion with God is on a higher level, but a Christian out of communion is degraded spectacle. Men respect the one, but they despise the other. The one would be a blessing to men, but the other may be a stumbling block and even a curse. Are we sleeping on the job? Are we as a church sleeping on the job? Let me ask you quite candidly. How many people have we converted? How many people have we, have we bring to Christ in this community since we came here over 10 years ago? How many people personally have you brought to God? How many people have you shared the word of God with? Yesterday I was having a meeting with some people in my office and one started talking about rapture and I bow, I bow my head in shame that over the years this was still their theology in their minds and I've not been able to work on them. Though I spent some time with them, I still bow my head in shame. We are family members who have not heard about the love of God. We are friends and family who do not know that there is an impending danger and we forget to, to speak to them. We, we go sleeping like the prophet Jonah. The hymn writer said, Head of the kingdom, why art thou slumber? Why art thou sleeping so near thy blessed home? Wake thee, arouse thee, and get on thy armor. Speed, for the moments are doing what? We know this story. We know this hymn. We sing it every now and then. The fifth stanza says, keep the eyes single, the head upward lifted. Watch for the glory of earth's coming king. Lo, oh, he's coming again. On the mountain tops, light now breaking. Heads of the kingdom, rejoice ye and sing. This is what Spurgeon has to say. Jonah was asleep amid all the confusion and noise. And oh, Christian man, for you to be indifferent to all that is going on in such a world as this, for you to be negligent of God's work in such a time as this is just as strange. The devil alone is making noise enough to wake all the Jonas if, if they only want to wake. All around us there is tumult and storm, yet some professing Christians are able and comfortably sleeping like Jonah. We're listening to radio too much. Well, we're listening to watch TV and watch prophets and, and, and priests. And, and I, I, I sometimes, when I'm listening around, I sometimes listen to Obedim and those to, to, to just laugh. But think about it. We know that they are lying to thousands. We know that they are lying to hundreds. But have we made any effort to bring the good news to them. And we slip in on the job. So the shipmaster, verse 6, came to him and said, What meanest thou, Judah? What, what are you thinking? What are you doing? Oh, sleeper, arise, call upon unto thy God. If so, be that God will think upon us that we perish not. What are you doing? All of us are praying. Or all of us are doing things. We, we're trying to see whether, whether we will not have any shipwreck. We, we're trying to save our lives. And you are here not minding and not, and not, and not taking part in it. God has not finished intervening in the life of rebellious prophet. But friends, it took a non-believer to bring his mind back. To God. This man that could answer a prayer, he knows him, but he was far asleep. He received a rebook, a chastisement, not from the God that he served, but from a heathen. A shipmaster. Sadly, there is no mention that Jonah does actually did pray. 
nor even respond to that command. Friends, backsliders are not people of prayer. If you are backsliding, there's no way you will pray. Backsliders don't pray. For what could a rebellious prophet pray? He already had heard from God, but he did not want to obey God. The Bible says in Psalm 66 verse 18, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Verse 7 to 8, the Bible says, And they said, everyone to his fellow, Come, let us cast laws that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So, they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, we beseech thee, tell us for, who, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thy occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country? And of what people art thou? These sailors cast lots, which implies that they did not feel their own sins merited the judgment that was befalling them. They, they realized that, yes, yes, we have stormed at sea, but we have not done anything. Come, all of us, come. Let's cast lots. They realized that they, 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 they are innocent of the cause that is ready to be fell on them. These sailors cast lots. This imperfect and shallow understanding of our sinfulness is particularly of sinners who never see themselves the way a holy God sees them. They were confident like Jonah, knowing very well that this cause is from him, was confident to go through the Lord's. Friends, sometimes we behave like the Achans. We bring disaster on the camp. We bring disaster on God's people and we don't confess our sins. And sometimes we come bare chested boldly and come and, and, and say we are ready to cast lots. Meanwhile, you know that the evil that is befallen is from you. Probably from me. They ask him, What is thine occupation? They ask multiple questions indicates that they were panicking. What do you do? What, what, where are you coming from? That they were panicking, but Jonah was still indifferent to them. Let's see what he says, verse 9 to 10. And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord. For once, he witnessed to them. For once, though running away from the calling, he, he witnessed to these Gentiles. For once, he gave his identity. I don't have time. I would have shed much insight onto his identity. He said, he's a Hebrew. When asked, who are you? We identify ourselves with our tribe, with our occupation, and possibly with our history. What we have done, what we have accomplished. With our occupation, I'm a planner, I'm a doctor. With our tribe, I'm a shanty, I come from Ghana. With all those things. He identified himself with his tribe because he cherished his tribe more than the calling. More than the calling. I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord. The Lord has an amazing way of making us do what we, we, we hate sometimes to do. We marvel at God's wisdom and, and God applies his wisdom, wisdom right here and he turns the prophet's mind back to his core duty. Backsliding leads us to contradict sometimes our own belief. Jonah's confession filled them with fear. They were afraid and they asked him, what have you done? Why? Where are you running to? Friends, I want to submit to you that some actions of believers even shock the unsaved. The sailors probably knew uh, um, something of Jehovah's power, such as the Red Sea. Probably they have heard of what God has done in, in the land of Egypt with Pharaoh. And, and, and they recognized and saw and they were amazed and terrified. Why 
have you done this? Why did God pick such a man with such rebellious attitude to go to Nineveh? This is what one theologian says. Whenever the word of the Lord comes to us, it demands a response. What will you do with what God has said? Will you run away to the other? If you decide to run, you'll probably find a ship going your way with one extra seat left. Better to die than to live. And they said unto him, what shall we then do to you? The reason they were hating, they were unbelievers, but they did not want to do anything that, that would bring disaster on, on the prophet of God. He, though he did not identify himself as a prophet of God, he identified himself as a Hebrew and he feared the Lord. He, he, they, 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 they did not want to do anything. Though the cause was from him, they did not want to quickly do anything unto him. He said, what shall we do unto you? That the sea may become for us. And he said unto them, take me up, cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea become for you. For I know that for my sake, this great tempest is upon us. For once, Jonah repented. For once, he told the truth. For once, he, he acknowledged Acknowledge that the fault is from him. For once he was able to die than the rest to die. And, and for once we see the story of the sacrificial sacrifice of Christ in this story where, where Jonah was ready to leave the ship and to go down the sea and die so that the rest could have life. And, and, and sometimes in our homes when our wives die certain things to us and we go, I will leave you. I'll divorce you. Have you forgotten what God says? He says, husbands, love your wife. As who? Christ loved the church. Jonah mistrusted the goodness of God, but he did, didn't know the cross. He, he had no excuse. Verse 15, so they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from raging. And these men, were afraid. Verse 16, then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord. The sailors feared. This is qualitatively new kind of fear. The fear of the Lord. These pagan sailors quickly made vows unto God. They, they quickly sacrificed and made vows to God. Unknown to them, they were serving and making vows to the God of Jonah. To the God of Jonah. Friends, the way up was first down. The usual place to learn the greatest secrets of God's grace is at the bottom of the sea. But it's not simply being at the bottom that begins the change. Jonah prayed in the belly of the fish. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord. His prayer was there. I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell. I cried, O thou heardest my voice. Verse 3 says, For thou hast heardest cast, for thou hast cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out thy sight. Yet I'll look again toward the holy city. Jonah lifted up his eyes to the holy city. Why? Because in the holy city, there is the holy temple. In the holy temple, there is the mercy seat. He cried and remembered that on the day of atonement, God purged the nation of Israel against him. And God atoned for all their sins. Then Jonah goes to say, but I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving and I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is now of the Lord. The Bible says, not the labors of our hand. The hymn writer writes, can fulfill thy Lord's command. Could thy zeal no respite? No. Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save. And only thou alone. Salvation is from God. 
trying to skip. Jonah prayed and went to the city to preach God's message to them. Even in his sermon and his delivery, he still did not want them to, 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 to repent and to save and to have mercy and grace. He, instead of telling them that if you don't change your mind, this is what God, he says, God shall in 40 days destroy you. He, he, he went under a tree waiting for the city to, 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 to be perished by God. Waiting for the destruction of the city. Not fulfilling now fulfilling his commission, he waited for the city to perish under his very eyes. And, and, and he heard news that, no, your, your message went down. The king of Nineveh, the, the, the entire city, all of them are in sackcloth. And the Bible says they are animals, they are children, they are women. Everybody repented. Mercy was sent to them. Grace was sent to them. And they responded affirmatively. And here was the prophet of God. Still not okay. Because in his heart, he wished that the Nivens would be destroyed. Friends, it is better sometimes to die than to live. As the prophet says. Because sometimes the things we wish for does not come. But friends, this morning I want to draw your attention to something unique whilst I bring my message to a close. Some, something unique, something that you've heard about it. But to, this morning I want to submit to you that it is better for us to die than to live. Because we have not done what is expected of us. Jonah has preached the message that is conversion. And the natural tendency should be that he is happy. Witnesses his prophecies before his very eyes. But he exclaimed that it is better to die than to live. It is better for us to die than to live when we neglect our core mandate as children of God. God called on us to be a blessing to the world, but rather we are a curse. We are called to bless the world, but rather we are becoming like a curse. How many times do we stick to our calling and our mandate? How many times do we preach the gospel to our friends at, at, at work and at school, wherever we find ourselves? Do we carry the arrow, aroma of Christ wherever we find ourselves? Do people see us and want to come to our church? In case you don't know the reality on the ground, I have some statistics for you, but for the sake of time, I will sum it up. The, the average growth rate of Ghana is about 5%. Every now and then, we baptize souls into the church. But every now and then, when we count our numbers, it's still the same. The entire 30 million population of Ghana, Adventists are now up to 1 million. We are hovering around 500. And boldly, we come to church and think that we are going to heaven. Our problem, friends, is that we love the Lord, but we love other things. We love the Lord, but we love other things more. Our problem, church, is that we love the Lord, but we don't love him with all our heart. Our problem, church, is that we hate Many sins, but not all sins, because for us, it is not all or something. We have a problem. Our problem, church, is that we follow the Lord, but not with all our mind and our heart. Our problem, church, is not that we don't witness, but because we witness about other things more than the Lord because sometimes it is all or something else. I want to submit to you, friends, that our problem is not that we are not, we, we, we're not whether we are passionate about the Lord's business. It is whether we are passionate with our calling. Our problem is not whether we serve the Lord, but whether 
is we serve him with all our strength and with all our heart. Our problem is that we are committed to the Lord. Our problem is not that we are committed to the Lord. The problem is whether we are committed with all our soul. Our problem, friends, is whether we obey the gospel or sometimes it is whether we obey. The church has lost her testimony. She has no longer anything to say to the world. Her once robust shout of assurance has faded away to an apologetic whisper. She who one time went out to, to declare, now goes out to inquire. Her dogmatic declaration has become respectful suggestion, a word of religious advice given with the understanding that it is after all only an opinion, not meant to sound bigoted. We are a church that is learning, yet ever knowing. We are a church ever learning, yet never knowing. We are a church full of more baptisms, yet less members. We dared sin, yet we dread to save. We preach virtue and practice vices. Intellectually stimulating doctrines we have, yet on school target an audience. The church is looking for improved missiological methods, yet God's, God is looking for improved men. Our problem is that we're a Bible-believing denomination, yet a biblically illiterate membership. Our problem is that there is partial obedience to God's word. And partial obedience to God's word is disobedience. Too many of us are impulsive volunteers. We have not yet counted the cost. We have not. And that is why we become prodigal members. Like the prodigal prophet Jonah. So it is better for us to die than to live. Because God says he can raise stones to speak his truth when we refuse. E.G. White has this to say, those who have really tasted the sweets of redeeming love will not, cannot rest until with whom they associate are made acquainted with the plan of salvation. Never ever rest, never ever be content, never ever as a child of God be okay until those that you associate with has heard the plan of salvation. Amen.